everybody, and welcome to GameSpot's Day One Rap Show here at E3 2014. I'm going to be your host, Sean McInnes. Joining me on stage is our illustrious cast of GameSpot editors who have spent all day checking out all kinds of video games. And we're going to get to a lot of really cool stuff today. But first, let's unpack what we've <laughs> seen so far. I like to keep it packed up, Sean. <laughs> no, 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 packed no, no, it up, no. Packed it up in a vertical slice. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to do a real deep dive. All right. Don't worry oh, about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, but first, let me introduce our cast. We've got Peter Brown right here. Hello. Chris Waters. Hey, everybody. And of course, Kevin Van Ord. Well, hey there. So, um, you know, we've all seen a lot of different games. Before we go too deep into any one of those, let's just talk about today. How did, how did it go so far for you guys? Kicked it off uh, watching Nintendo Direct uh, over my breakfast and was delighted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People were really pumped about this Nintendo Direct, and I'm going to be honest with you, I did not expect that. No, no, no. Uh, it was it was full of joy. It was full of like fun digital stuff, and then uh, the rest of my day was live show hosting, which we'll get into a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Game shot spots two live shows. Uh, a lot of cool games there. Yeah. yeah. So, what was the highlight for you, Peter Brown, from the Nintendo digital event this morning? Uh, I mean, Zelda easily. Yeah. I think we saw such a small slice of that, but uh, the world looks amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm really impressed with what they've been able to do with the Wii U. Everyone in this room was like, there's no way that's on the Wii U, but whatever. The game looks great. Even it's going back to its roots in terms of powerful the enemies world. appearing in uh, such Adrian a peaceful Numa is in the world. Is one <laughs> as you can see here, he's a giant. <laughs> yeah, he's an enemy you have to defeat with, with love. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just think this game looks wonderful. I can't, I can't like, wait to play it. There's like antelopes in there. I yeah. didn't notice that before. On the right side, that's yep. cool. Totally. Yeah. There's Aww. a lot to look at here. And this is where that little enemy comes That little enemy. That large fire spewing enemy comes in and raises hell quite literally. Um, and then Link unveils himself to be, uh, well, kind of similar to his appearance in the beginning of Skyward Sword, right? Mm -hmm. He's yeah. got his PJs on. Yeah, he does. I Personally, I hope he doesn't bring back his green tunic. I kind of like this take on Link. Yeah? Yeah, I really do. I think it gives the game kind of a fresh, fresh taste. I hope the open <laughs> world means that uh, they can tell me where the tutorial area is, where I can learn all about how to play the game, and then I can never go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't want to spend three hours learning it? Oh, oh God. No. I'm, I'm looking forward to the dozen hours spent teaching me how to hold the controller. Yeah. And uh, after that, maybe like, I'll actually play the game. Like this. I got you covered. Yeah. Oh, good. That's more good. or less how you hold. Good. The you got me covered. I, this is this is great. You Splatoon me so much looks today. really cool. Uh, yeah. I thought that that as in terms of a multiplayer shooter with some cut fresh mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, painting the whole level, but then being able to use that paint as like a traversal system. Mm -hmm. You're like, because you go into squid mode and you you go super fast, but you have to like leap from your color to your color, and then you can warp to wherever your teammates are. I just thought there was a bunch of like simple things that work there that have that the potential to do that thing where they like combine to make like a really cool dynamic. It looks really clever. Nobody can complain now that Nintendo doesn't do new IPs. Because they did Because one. we have something <laughs> brand new, completely unexpected from Nintendo. Yeah. I've got to say my favorite thing was probably uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X. Mm -hmm. We already knew this game was coming. We were calling it X prior to now. Sure. Um, but Xenoblade Chronicles is my favorite JRPG over the last several years, um, if not the last five, six, seven years. Um, and so having a sequel to that has me really, really excited. And it was interesting seeing something that was so tonally different from the, the incredible joy we were getting from most of the stuff at the press conference. It just felt like they're, they're, really, they're really capturing something here. And I'm not a Nintendo guy, but I, they, they won the show for me. Yeah, and it was an interesting yeah. uh, counterpoint to the press conferences that we saw on Monday, which I don't know if you guys were keeping track, but a lot of severed limbs. Yeah, a six, lot I of think. There are about six <laughs> severed limbs, arms, heads. There was a lot, and it's always just nice jumping to Nintendo after all that is kind of like a palate cleanser to remind you that it's all, it's not all blood and gore and doom and gloom. There's there's more to video games, right? Especially when they leaned into that with like those uh, robot chicken sketches and the like like Iwata versus Reggie, yeah. like intro fight. Like this is just like this was an amazing. They had the way. Luigi death stare in there at one point. <laughs> like they are really. It was a great sign that they're sort of embracing, you know, that 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 goofy side, that like heartwarming fun side that Nintendo can nail. 
All right. Well, I mean, it sounds like you guys had fun with the Nintendo press conference this morning, and you're all still alive, which is always step number one <laughs> for E3. Don't get killed or trampled on the first day, and you guys seem to be doing just fine with that. We're on. We're super on. Point. I'm very yeah. proud of you guys. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we jump into what we've all specifically seen today, starting with Kevin Van Ord there on the end. Kevin, oh I think of everybody that I talked to today, kind of like recapping what they got to see, you probably have the most impressive docket of stuff that you've seen so I far. I had a good day um, between yeah. today and last night, but today the, the big one for me was The Witcher 3. Um, I'm, I've already been very excited about The Witcher 3, in part because I love The Witcher 2 and love The Witcher 1 for that matter. Um, but what they've shown, uh, what they showed last year was really impressive, but this year, I mean, they've just, they've really got me at this stage. It just feels like the RPG that does everything. You know, we, we think about RPGs and we think, well, this RPG just, this RPG is really about the combat and this one's about the big world and this one's about the choices and this one's about the story and this game looks like it's about all of the things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's what's really getting me and the thing is everything that they show that's all of the things, all of the things are really good just as the individual pieces, let alone in how they come together. And so everything just looks remarkable. The game looks beautiful but it looks beautiful both up close and you know in a in the broad spectrum kind of way you know the combat looks really fun it looks like they've really cleaned up you know the uber difficult sort yeah. of awkward combat from the, the Witcher 2 yeah do you feel like it's going to be a game that people can like get into a little bit better because The Witcher 2, a wonderful game, one of my favorites of the past few years, but my god, does it take an effort to get into that game. I think it's going to be easier to get past that a casual game where they don't see the Witcher series as that casual. And in a sense, they're right. Most people yeah. can get into Skyrim and, and get going pretty quickly. I do think that there you do have to give a little bit more to The Witcher 3 than you, than you would to an Elder Scrolls game. But my god, does this thing look amazing. So let's talk specifically about the demo that they showed there. Can yeah. you give us the kind of nuts and bolts? Totally. Well, it starts with you in one of the largest cities. Mm -hmm. um, they called it the largest city in, in the Witcher universe. It's not the largest city in the Witcher universe. Like how would you compare out, it to Cincinnati, Ohio? Which I feel <laughs> like is the baseline for a lot of us. I would say that um, in The Witcher 2, or The Witcher 3, there's probably more crime okay. than in Cincinnati, for okay. sure. Maybe even more crime than Gary, Indiana. Ooh, or, wow. You know, Hot and that's, bit of criminal that's, activity. Yeah, that's saying something. Mm -hmm. But ser seriously, like, one of the things I liked about the city design when, they, when, we fr when I first went there is that, you know, when you play other RPGs, a lot of cities seem very... You know, they seem like almost computer generated in the way that this, the houses fit together just so. And it's like an urban planner really worked these places out mm -hmm. in a lot of RPGs. This looked like a place where it's like, oh, it started small on the port and then it just grew. And it looked like this is the way towns look. Right. Yeah, you know? it just started with a city center and then just mutated appendages branched yeah. out from there. And it's, yeah. the it, streets don't make sense. It looked super organic. But even going on outside of that, you know, the, the excitement of going out into a world and, you know, you know, you see here, for example, Geralt's out there on, on the trail, you know, of, of, of a creature that has left its, its mark. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It's not always a giant monster. The, what I saw was I saw a creature called a godling, which was something I'd never seen before. Yeah, we caught a glimpse of it earlier in the footage, sort of like a uh, short creature, bluish skin, but like really big yellow eyes. Yeah, it was yeah. sort of like if you took Gollum and combined it with a Smurf. You know, kind of thing. Like it was, it That's wasn't. Really good. It wasn't like evil, that. but it was kind of cute. And then, but it had that lost is, its that voice. That is a, a love child that should not exist. <laughs> and then you had and to help. And yet, nature finds a way. <laughs> and then you had to help it find its voice. And the one downside to what I saw today was all of the quests were basically like, "I'll give you what you need to know, 
but you need to do me a favor. And then that favor took you to the person who will do the thing for you, but only if you do so, something for them first. And so it was this kind of weird three quest deep fetch quest. Mm -hmm. And that was really my only complaint, was that it wasn't that well veiled. Everybody yeah. was like, I'll give you the info to get you to the person who's going to give you the info with the info that I give you, right. but only if you do me the favor, which in turn is doing the favor that the other person wants, so that, that then you can do the favor. That's the currency the Witcher deals in. Information <laughs> and favors, you know? That's it's, sort of, that's how that world works. It's yeah. Witcher dogs. It, yeah, it's all about the, uh, it's all about the, the, the information and the, yeah. Which this isn't working. I'm a little tired, I'm sorry. <laughs> no I thought problem. you were talking about like, Tube meat made out of griffin hide. No, that was just a. That was actually the perfect segue bad. for me because you also got to check out some Ubisoft stuff. I did see some Ubisoft stuff. I played Far Cry 4 today. You played so, you played Far Cry 4. You got to see some Assassin's Creed. I Unity, saw some Assassin's Creed Unity last and night. And even a bit of Rainbow Six and Siege. And I played a full match of Rainbow Six Siege last night. Of wow. those, of those three, which one wowed you the most? Um, well, in terms of pure fun, probably Far Cry 4. Okay. But I, I gotta say, it was probably Rainbow Six Siege that has me most interested because it's really? it's different. We're so used now to shooters that are really bombastic, mm -hmm. right? And and even in the world of competitive shooters, it's it's overtaken by Call of Duty and even in Titanfall. And people love Counter Strike, but even now, Counter Strike's taken on a different a different kind of uh, pace than it used to have. You know, people like blast through Counter Strike matches now, where it used to be kind of more careful, and you know, and and this was really careful. Like this had a lot of really interesting stuff going on in Rainbow Six. Um, so, you know, one of the big things, there we go. There so we one go. of the big things is that, so you have two teams against each other, two teams of five. So yep. one is defending and you have to set up defenses. You have like one a preparation the stage. One versus the banks. <laughs> basically, uh, yeah. basically, you know. You've you're got the, the real homeowner. estate magnates and the NIMBYs. And, and the, the, you know, the. the <laughs> Not in my backyard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so the foreclosure Come on, people. Chris. I don't so get the that cultural touch. <laughs> so the foreclosure people are coming to clearly murder your wife. Uh -huh. yep. Yep. And so As you have to protect her. Uh, no, but seriously, like you, you have this whole like pre, you know preliminary part where you have to set up. So you see here, like the defense people are setting up, you know, and, and you have to reinforce windows, reinforce walls, put down some barbed wire, mm -hmm. you know, even get some proximity mines down if necessary. And then you've got the attacking team, and what they're doing is they use these little. Um, drones, these ground drones. What do and they actually you, look like? Is it just like a tube, like a cylinder? It that looks they roll like a little. Ground? It looks like a little cylinder. Yeah, kind of like thing that when rolls they pulled the it out, it was just like a little tube, a little metallic hot dog. Yeah. And suddenly it becomes. It's basically like that, except you know you see it from first person when you're attacking. So okay. I don't really have a sense exactly of what what its design is like. But you 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 know as you know for them. Um, the defenders have to choose where the hostage is going to go and where how they're going to you know spread out and and defend and then as the attackers you have to use your drones to figure out where they put the hostage and how they're they're setting up their defenses and where the different players are and then once you know, once that preliminary part is over, it's done. Now it's time to get to the shooting. But what makes it really interesting is how careful it goes. The attacking team has to mm -hmm. breach through all of these, you know, defenses that have been set up, and that makes noise. Yeah. Um, this is not just a, you know, go through and start shooting everybody and like bullets everywhere. The other cool part is, you know, you notice like they're, they're. Um, you know they're setting up defenses where walls are, but like, why do you why do you need to reinforce a wall? Well, the reason you have to reinforce a wall is because it's like in real life how bullets will actually penetrate see walls. See it right here, yeah, yeah, and Not so just penetrate, but like shred. In yeah. a lot of cases, yeah. yeah. Um, and so this becomes a real tactical thing here, where it's like, you know, say you're the defending team, you might actually you know shoot out a little circle so you can keep an eye on on anybody that's coming past and, and shoot at them. Oh, interesting. Like and even in the preliminary phase it might be part of your scouting. it might be part of your scouting it might be part of like your just defenses I mean it could be like basically hey I'm setting up this little bit and I'm gonna try to catch anybody coming by almost like like a window or something mm -hmm. like that so it's just it's really fascinating and it's it's great and really carefully paced and it's so different from most of the shooters that I play nowadays that I'm really 
I was impressed by something that really did require, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, this requires teamwork. This really did require a lot of talking and trying to figure out what it is we were doing. Speaking of talking. Hey, what's going on? We've got Danny O'Dwyer on the stage Sorry, here. Sorry, I know you just, I don't want to interrupt for too long, but uh, I, I've got some breaking news that just happened on uh, the GameSpot stage earlier. Here, oh, talking um, to my throat, Danny. I'm doing it right now. Uh, the creator <laughs> of te Tetris, we had uh, Alexei uh, Pijivnov, I can never pronounce names properly, uh, on our stage. I got him to confirm that Tetris Ultimate is coming to PlayStation 4 Xbox One will in fact be 1080p running at 60 frames per second. Ooh. Oh my goodness, Breaking shots news. fired that in the resolution <laughs> battle. <laughs> Tetris. Also the also, 1080p. Also the Ubisoft representative designer guy uh, who was there said, and I quote, we're really trying to get the most out of the hardware. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, Tetris. in this day and age, it's 60 frames per second Tetris or GTFO. Yeah, yeah really, <laughs> seriously. Why even Listen, bother? That series is just built on repetition, and they really need to innovate. You need that fast pace, that fluidity, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, 30 totally. FPS just doesn't cut totally. it. Totally. Why so even Sean, bother? While Danny's here, can you He's do not here he's anymore. Gone. He's gone. Dan, Dan, come back, Danny. Yeah. Dan, can you do your <laughs> Danny O'Dwyer impression? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> because this is this is this is really good. This My is name good. is Danny O'Dwyer. I'm from Waterford, Ireland. Yeah. And true. I just did a racist voice live on the internet. Great. Thanks, Kevin Van Ord. My, My pleasure. My, My political career. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that was rich. Fun fact: Danny's breath smells like peanuts. Hmm. So I had a cookie. he had a cookie. Confirmed. Danny just cookie had a peanut, confirmed. Confirmed. peanut butter cookie. Cookie is the source <laughs> of his peanut butter. 1080p butter. cookie confirmed. 1080 peanuts. Before we abandon the Rainbow Six discussion, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, and this is something that grabbed my attention. It seems like very intimate environments, yeah. very close quarters, and we yeah. saw a lot of teamwork in terms of one guy's got a riot shield, the other guy's behind him, like leaning out and like yeah. firing. Yeah. yeah. Does it seem like the type of game where that's going to work in the real human world? Because that requires so much coordination and real human beings in co-op shooters tend to run in front of each other's guns, tend to absorb bullets when they don't mean to. Like, d does it end up working out? Well, I mean, I did play with people I'd never played games with before. Now, mm -hmm. granted, you know, when you watch these Ubisoft presentations, all of the people playing these games seem so, they're practically role-playing. Oh, yeah. You know, in that they sense. They are, yeah. When it's like, people don't talk like that when they play. When, when people play shooters, they're really just like, God damn it! Fuck you, dude! Get over to the other side! Guys, dude, dude. I got my what are you doing? Guys, what are you, what? Guys, He's over guys. here! He's over here! Clean language. Over here. He's over here. He's over here. Yeah. Oh. No, I said, and that is relatively clean language compared oh, yeah, to what yeah. you would normally hear. Or they're just totally silent and lone wolfing it. You're like, <laughs> what, where did they even go? What just happened? I thought we were yeah. breaching. They're across the street. It doesn't strike me as though the kind of person that's going to play like that is going to get enough griefing joy mm -hmm. out of this game, even if they do try to go that route to stick with it for long. This is more like, I think, like the people that like, even something like the Splinter Cell co-op. I think this is the kind of thing that those type of people will like. Mm -hmm. Something that really does require you to, you, you know, to the game, communicate. The game kind of self-selects for it to yeah. a certain extent. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, in the, in the end, I don't know. And in the end, maybe there will be other maps that kind of you know, have, you know, feature larger numbers of people that might get something more out of a, a larger kind of firefight, but I think that would kind of defeat the purpose of what this is in the first place. Uh, was honestly. the hostage the lady? The hostage was the lady did, every time I played. Did you do any explody bits? Is that a euphemism? Like, no, they're like, flow, <laughs> sorry, I can see how that would have been a little confusing. Did you put the uh. explosive things down and blow up walls and jump through them? I did not do anything quite like that. It was really fun though because um, you know in, in the final round because we, we, we tied and so we had to go into a third tie breaking round. And what was really fun about that is things started to get really close and it did come down to like one of these uh, holes in the wall where I'm like I'm getting I got two dudes as they went by and then another dude caught on like widened the hole and I didn't really have anywhere to go and so I tried to rush out and he got me and I went down and my teammate revived me but then the hostage went down and so Ooh. she comes first so he yeah. like gets to her and then comes back to me and he comes up just in time to get shot down. The hostage is up. I get up onto my feet because I just managed to get revived, and then boom, I'm down wow. with an explosive, and it was done. So it came down to the wire, but oh. uh, well, that's good. Like, yeah, it was really fun and really exciting. Like that, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, sounds like you had a lot of fun with that, and Peter Brown had a lot of fun with the game that he got to check out today. But before we get into that, <sighs> we're gonna jump away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Why don't you just Almost why don't you just step off the stage for a minute? <laughs> All right. Do your thing, whatever. We're okay. gonna jump to a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Peter's gonna talk about Metal Gear Solid. Stick with us.
And we are back. GameSpot's day one wrap-up show here from E3 2014 continues. Next up, we've got Peter Brown. Hi. Who, actually, I'm going to delay you one more second. Later on in the show, you can send us questions using the hashtag GameSpot E3. We're going to collect those questions for you. Oh, sorry, Peter Brown. Oh, I just, I we're going to we be getting to those later. But I just want you to know, tweet us questions using that hashtag, and we're going to answer them live on the air later on. Now, Peter Brown. Are you sure? Men <laughs> wait, wait. OK, yes. Metal Gear Solid Five. Yeah. The Phantom Pain. Mm -hmm. I know we're both huge Metal Gear Solid fans. Yes. I'm very jealous that you actually got to see the game. You should be. <laughs> and I am. I am. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about it. how does it compare with that trailer that they released yesterday. Uh, the trailer that they showed was very dramatic. You know, it was Kojima trying to do his cinematic thing, and uh, you know, it played with a lot of really dark tones and uh, kind of you know just dark and dra dramatic. The, once they got into the gameplay, it started off with that scene where you see. Ocelot and Big Boss riding in on horses, mm -hmm. you know, and he's talking about, oh, bring the legend back to life. And you're basically going to save your uh, compatriot, Master Miller, who is helping you out in Ground Zeroes, who has been captured by the Soviets and is now held on a base in Afghanistan. Um, once the gameplay starts, about 10 seconds into the demo, things just get ridiculous. Um, it's such a stark contrast to what they're showing here with mm -hmm. people screaming and blood and fire. Um, and the things that stood out to me are actually things that are pretty reminiscent of uh, features in Peace Walker. Uh, most notably, the Fulton system, okay. which uh, is a Peace Walker was all about building up your mother base. Mm -hmm. And uh, to do that, you would incapacitate enemies and attach this little device to their back that would poof up with a little balloon, and they get whisked away to mother base, right? You're basically abducting people. You are, yes. And you, you are. You abduct them with balloons? You abduct them. You bet them. you do. It's called, Chris, <laughs> it's, you don't abduct them with balloons. You rescue them with the Fulton recovery system. It's yeah. very different. And then you force them to work for you. Yeah. Some of them become cooks. Some of them become soldiers. It just really depends where their skills lie. That's the beauty of Peace Walker. <laughs> it is weird. It is a little bit weird. But um, I like it. Okay. I hate to interrupt yeah. here, but what is going on seriously with that canister? Cocaine is a it's hell of a drug. Yeah. Moisturizing. <laughs> Those are the ashes of the soldiers from uh, the original mother base that was destroyed in Ground Zeroes when Big Boss, as you see here, although really he was still naked, he was still Snake at this point. I don't think he yeah. becomes Big Boss until after the mission we saw okay. uh, during the demo today. Um, and so those are the ashes of his fallen soldiers, and he's uh, he's essentially, I think, sort of taking the blame on onto himself mm -hmm. at that point. Thanks, Thanks for clearing ever, that up. You're welcome. Guy ever hip fire guy? Yeah, hip fire, <laughs> hip -fire guy. guy uh, don't give a shit. This is Mother about Base right etiquette. here. That's Master Miller. Uh -huh. um, Mother Base is essentially your little compound where you run your private military corporation. Uh, and you, you run these. Yes. Nano machines. And you run that because you believe in rights for soldiers. You feel like they've been exploited all around the world. You want to give them a fighting chance of having a career and a life that's in their control. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people want to want to fuck with that. Yeah. Yeah. I believe <laughs> uh, so, uh, so in the Phantom Pain, uh, you you gain currency by abducting soldiers with the Fulton system. You can also abduct abduct goats, and <laughs> vehicles, and Is massive uh, freight containers. <laughs> and uh, there's basically if it's not a building, plastic you can, lawn chairs. You can abduct it. You can abduct anti uh, uh, you know aircraft uh, guns. Wow. Can and you abduct a rock? I don't know. Ugh. I can't confirm rock, ab rock abduction. Rock abduction. Um, you're just taking anything that's not nailed down. <laughs> <laughs> like Skyrim, you're just like, that's mine, and that's basically, mine. Basically. <laughs> basically. And, uh, and so one of the interesting things here is that like Mother Base is quite literally your base. And uh, throughout Afghanistan are a number of bases where Miller is held captive. And well, I don't think this is the whole game, but at least in, at the start of the game, you're trying to capture Miller, or to you know, recover him. Mm -hmm. And you can go to any of those bases to do that. You go to the right one, you get some information, you figure out where he might be. Um, and so you spend a lot of time, you know, infiltrating this base and, well, man, it just, things get really interesting. So uh, did you guys catch a little bit of gameplay that was shown during the uh, Kojima Station podcast? No. They showed some gameplay and one of the things they showed is the cardboard box, right? Mm. Everyone knows the cardboard box from Metal Gear. Before, you'd sort of, you'd plop it on top of you, you'd sneak around, when you were done with it, you kind of throw it off. Uh, it has many, well, it has a few more functions now. So you can have the box on top of you, sneak into a place, and you don't actually have to throw the box off. You can pop up out of the top, um, which is new. Uh, on the other hand, so if, that's like that's an aggressive move. That's that's not, an aggressive. Yeah, move. that's a like yeah, pop up, bang bang. You can also situation. use it as a decoy. So let's say you're sneaking it through as a box. Someone sees you, and you know you see that the enemy is alerted to your presence. You can actually dive out of the side of the box, and then he goes to search it, and you're free to just go roam around. 
Um, Does it have a Sharpie drawing on the inside that says transmogrify that allows you to turn <laughs> into lizards or tigers? <laughs> No, not confirmed. No. Okay. Oh, no. um, it's almost, there are so many crazy, interesting things that I saw in this, it's kind of hard to come up with them all. But back, back to Mother Base, this is, this is very much a large portion of the game, and, mm -hmm. and you collect currency, and you, know, you essentially design this base to your own specifications. Um, so I think that is one of the things that's pretty unique in this compared to Peace Walker. Before, I think you had some control, I don't remember the exact breadth of it, but the way it is now, I mean, you really do have control over where things are placed, how tall they are, how many soldiers are there, what the soldiers are doing with their time. You can train them, obviously, to become stronger and you know up your intel units. Um, so it, there's it some was a real dense demo. There. Like there, in oh, addition yes. to like yes. you know forays out into the field, there's yes. you know you you sort of growing your force, you you managing so. that and, and deciding what you want to prioritize, you know, strategically to gain from that. And it's it, at this point, it's kind of hard to see how that really plays into the story at hand, mm -hmm. because we all know that right now, you know, Snake Big Boss is out for revenge, mm -hmm. more or less. And uh, it's basically, you can't get your revenge until you get Miller. I don't know why, but that was a thing that was brought up in the demo. Miller helps you make it revengeance, and yeah. then you can get it. Eh. Uh. <laughs> eh. That's a stretch. My Metal Gear humor is super weak, dude. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> well, I mean, Miller was always like your right-hand man yes. in Peace Walker. He was the guy, like, Snake was out there in the wild, and Miller was the guy who made things happen. Yes. He was a very... He was a very handy guy, and you can imagine why getting him back on your side would help things out. Speaking of handy, uh, Snake uh, Big Boss has a prosthetic <laughs> arm now that is a robot, robotic arm, right? Uh -huh. And uh, you know you can like knock on walls to get, get guards' attention? Mm -hmm. One of the things you can do now, you don't even have to be near a wall, you can spin your wrist, it'll be like, like it'll spark and click. And that's that's that, the knocking mechanic. Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not just other games just have a whistle? He can whistle to make noise, but Snake has to do the. <laughs> yeah. Why wouldn't you spin your robo wrist? Because yeah. if it's sparking, it's doing something wrong. The metal is you grinding know, metal. Yeah. It's probably not good for the engineering of your wrist. Do you realize it's not how a much bug, money? It's a feature. That guy spent so much money on that prosthetic arm. Yeah. You don't have health insurance as a PMC. <laughs> No, uh, it's all out of pocket. <laughs> yeah. Um, another big thing they're talking about with ground or uh, with Phantom Pain is that you know weather and time sort of come you know as naturally as they would in the real world, mm -hmm. probably at a more denser you know a faster pace. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to pass time to actually figure out how soldiers move when their shifts end, you actually pull out a cigar and you smoke it, but it's an e-cigar, and the smoke it produces is like a holographic smoke. They didn't what? have that in the 80s. Come on, <laughs> Kojima. Jump didn't they, Sean? You don't know didn't what went they? on in Mother Base in the 80s. That's true. They I were yeah. vaping up a storm. Um, there, there was a whole lot of tech on display. Your iDroid can do a lot of different things. Um, gather information. You don't necessarily take a document. You, you scan it with your iDroid, and then it kind of gets pulled in. Miller will then get that and decipher it and tell you, OK, well, here's what this says, and send data to you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I could, I could keep going. But there's so many things to talk about. I would love for you to be able to keep going, and I'm sure that you will when you post your coverage on GameSpot.com. I got a lot of words. That's yeah. going to be a lengthy preview, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. So fellow Metal Gear nuts will be able to dive deep into Peter's vertical slice <laughs> of Metal Gear Solid. See? See? Pretty good. That was good. Yeah, yeah you got the yeah. terminology down. But in, the mean, Boy, I tell you. but in the meantime, we're going to shift the discussion over here towards Chris Waters, who, unlike us, was not running around between appointments all day. It's not my beat. He's a he's that. a man. Sucker's game. He's a man of leisure. Getting to actually play games? No, no, no. Uh, I just sit there and people bring the games to me and talk about them, because I do the live stage show hosting. Yeah. We have two stages going this year, and we're rotating hosts throughout. So for about four hours, I was on both of the stages hosting uh, a whole bunch of demos. And uh, you know, some of them were was stuff that we saw at the press conference, you know, uh, two guys from Sledgehammer, the co-founders of Sledgehammer Games came and showed off Advanced Warfare. But that was, we sort of talked a, a little bit more in depth about the stuff in, in the trailer, but the stuff that sort of interested me, the, the sort, of, sort of stood out that I want to mention here, mm. there's a couple of things I hadn't really seen before. Okay. So one of those things was actually a game I'd never heard of until, yeah, here we got like a Call of Duty, you're printing bullets in your gun. <laughs> 3D uh, printer gun. And it looks really good. And the tech in that game seems really neat and to talk and doing the kind of uh, customizing your exosuit to do like bigger jumps, bigger melee attacks, like, you know. I tried to press them for information about how flexible that's going to make make your sort of choices within the environment. But as usual with these kind of you know big initial reveals, 
they're very coy mm -hmm. about a lot of the, the, the nitty gritty. So the first stage demo actually was a game called Heavy Bullets, which is out now on Steam Early Access, and it looks like this. Ooh. Mm. So it's that, was a, that was a quick cut. I'm impressed with our video yeah. team. That's yeah, great. So wow. This is a game, it's a roguelike, so you start every playthrough fresh. You have this revolver with six bullets in it, and if you'll, you watch them, him fire a bullet, he loses it, but then he picks it back up in the environment. So that's sort of how you, you need to preserve your bullets. You fight, you, you shoot the few enemies that, uh, that appear, and you gather currency. And currency allows you to, like, uh, you know, do some investing that sort of helps mitigate the uh, total wipe that a roguelike does any time you die, right? So you can buy health insurance to get a little more life when you respawn. You can buy, you can uh, put some money into the bank to have some more money on the other side of it. And it, it sort of is, I can hear these, leisure, these levels are procedurally generated, they're different each time, and you're sort of learning about these enemies, and it's very, you notice the player pace is going very slowly, because as happened in the demo, actually, if you overextend yourself, you know, you've got like, what, three hearts? If you get a little aggressive, you're gonna get blasted really quick, unless you're, you've played it a ton of times and you're going for a speed run. So it just seemed like one of these, uh, you know, certainly aesthetically very interesting, mm -hmm. but like games that you, you know, you break down, you play time and time again and learn from and then get better and better. And it's full of secrets hidden here and there and items that you can buy that like maybe you don't know what they do. And like the Steam community has figured out what a lot of the items do, but there are still items out there that they still don't know what they do. So that was a neat one uh, to kick things off. And then uh, we had a real sizable demo for Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. And this is a game that Dan Hines came back from the demo. We asked him, so what did you think? And I believe his exact words were a fucking game of show, man. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Have you, any of you guys gotten to see it in, 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 in any depth? I have not been able to see it myself, but he basically described it as... You have, you basically play as Corvo Atano from Dishonored uh -huh. with the climbing gloves of an Assassin's Creed main character and the uh, NPC AI of Far Cry 2. <laughs> that is quite a combo. I, was, yeah. I, I yeah. didn't quite... Yeah. So, Try to unpack that, Chris. So the NPC AI is something that's actually really interesting about this game. And they talked about the nemesis system and how, like, you know, the, the guys that you fight will... Uh, you know, if you don't kill them, you can they can they can remain at large in the world. They can be promoted within the ranks. So, the one thing I loved was reading Randolph Ramsey's preview of this game. He got he got killed in a mob by some lowly orc. But time doesn't stop when you get killed. It continues, and that orc like basically is like, dude, I just killed the biggest villain in all of Mordor. You know that badass dude who was coming around here? I killed him. So like that orc is a captain next time you come around, and he's like armored up and like has better gear and better <laughs> abilities and then you like Randy tried to take a shot at him again and take him down and he failed and like that orc got even stronger so um, and the flip side of that is the AI wise like if people if orcs are in battles that you are in and they escape or you you are like you know just destabilizing their sort of faction their sort of a squad and not actually killing them they hold a grudge against you and they will actively seek you out they will, their behavior in the game will change around your actions and they'll come after you and they'll level up and like get better as you get better. Ooh. And they all have all these great <laughs> names like, uh, I can't even remember any, but maybe we'll see one here like the gut buster or the, the foul, I don't know. I can't, I can't do it justice. The rectum wrecker? Yeah, I mean, if I <laughs> was a they have, they have like a database of like different pre, you know, different, uh, different bits so that they can just procedurally put them together mm -hmm. so that they always have different names in all your playthroughs. Yeah, and so, so th and then this, you know, there's one objective that came up there that was part of this de demo that they were highlighting. So it was kill five war chiefs. So it's not just one, two, three, four, five, these are where these guys are, go kill them. It's you pull it up and they show you like a roster of 18 orcs and you shift through them and they're all war chiefs and you choose which ones are going on your kill list. And so the ones that don't get chosen, may, you know, that's gonna affect how they, how their, you know, uh, development works. The ones you do choose, uh, you know, you sort of target them and then 
What you see here is, I think, I'm pretty sure. This dude sure. is just getting, yeah. I don't I don't know if he's, if he's pressed the terrorize button, mm -hmm. but that dude's <laughs> getting terrorized. That's an interrogation. Okay. And then you get to choose, like, what you do with that information afterwards. Well, this so, re he's, he's telling this guy now to assassinate somebody else. And I think this, they were talking, like, and there's a chance of success, right? So you dominate these orcs, you, you can bend them to your will using these wraith powers, and you could send them on their way to try to take someone down, of course. This guy's not going to have a great chance against that dude, but maybe it creates the distraction that you need. Maybe it gives you an in, or maybe it just pisses that dude off. And you, you're you like, you let him know I'm coming for you. Uh, so that kind of whole... And then as you, you dominate dudes and bend them to your will and get them in your faction, they're like your army. And so you you have these resources to sort of direct and these, these, per, these orc personalities that you sort of get into. And that whole kind of mechanic was really fascinating to me. It just struck me as something mm -hmm. I had not really seen, in, certainly in a game like this, but yeah. And we also, I also went on at length about some Tolkien lore. <laughs> yeah. Got, got, <laughs> I uh, bet you did. We got into it a little bit. Uh, so th that stage demo is going to be posted on the site. You guys can watch that if you want to hear more about that. Um, you also uh, got to check out the Halo Master Chief collection. Oh, yeah. Now this one, you know, I mean, I'm a big Halo fan. Oh, yeah. So, we know that. Like, Playing Combat Evolved Anniversary when that came out a couple years ago was a real thrill. Just and like pressing that button to do that, and see. So this is Halo 2, the first level. Just watching that happen and seeing the the difference in the design and how that artistic aesthetic that was great 10 years ago is still great now, but like it's spruced up and like I mean having these memories. I don't know if you guys have them of like the first time you pulled up that second gun in a Halo game, like. That was novel. That was incredible. And then the the they talked about the multiplayer and watching that Ascension multiplayer match during the press conference just brings back all these memories. And I guess, you know, I think they're curating this really well. And that's what really impresses me is they have this kind of, it's not quite art, an archival approach. I mean, it partially is. Like, Peter, you you know, you mm -hmm. are really into, uh, you, you take, take passion in... Uh, Preserving games as they were played, getting to experience them in the way that they, you know, were popular. You know, when they were if it's 20 years ago on a Genesis, on a CRT monitor, that's a very specific experience. I think with this, this is a, an interesting model of how you do the kind of archival work to preserve video games, mm -hmm. but still do it in a way that is consumer focus that makes it a viable project project for a studio that's trying to make money right you know that's that is sort of a way that it, it's freshening it up but still preserving it and, and sort of taking that opportunity to to draw attention to that and do it in a way like you don't have to play through all of Halo 2 to get to play all the levels of Halo 2 you yeah can just jump into any one right one thing I liked about it is that they just assume that listen these games are old as hell you've played them before all this stuff is going to be unlocked from the start, and yeah. if you want to just like dip into various parts of different games, you can do that. You can make a playlist of the Warthog levels, the Flood levels, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to me, it was like the metaphor I used is like listening to your favorite band's catalog on shuffle. Yeah. You know it's the band you like, you don't know what you want to get into right now, but you know, you hit that shuffle button, all of a sudden you just, boom, you're there. You are absorbing that catalog. The thing that interests me about it is it feels like what you know what what they end up doing is they end up giving us the game that we remember it being 10 years later. Mm -hmm. the, it's the kind of thing where you go back and it's like this doesn't look as good as I remember. It strikes me that that's what they're really giving us is that they're giving us the game as our imaginations have created it to be in as, as the years have gone past, mm -hmm. you know. That's that's what I like about that kind of kind of approach. Yeah. So that you know that that collection, you know, obviously it's Easy to do with a franchise, well, not easy, but, you know, certainly the Halo franchise mm -hmm. and its its reach and its popularity makes it a real easy, uh, good target for this kind of thing. But I hope that this, that 343 Industries' work in this vein inspires other developers to do similar stuff with their own games, because uh, I think it's just great. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that you've got multiplayer in there for all four of those games, too. Yeah, man. I don't know how that is going to work. Yeah. A hundred maps? How are you going to get people to, like... <laughs> Yeah, I don't, how you have any chance of playing a map that you specifically want to play. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. It's going to be chaotic. I do like that they said that they're going to leave the multiplayer exploits in there mm -hmm. as they existed way back when. Like so little flag bounce across. Flag bounce, things, you know? EXP boosting, whatever you want to do. Yeah. 
They, they said, I, you know what, we're, we're not going to mess with that stuff. I did ask them about the ranking system because Halo 2 was one of the last games I remember being really into where your rank could go up and down. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's a, that's a thing in a lot of competitive play these days, but not in a lot of sh competitive shooters. Mostly these days, it's just you're either accruing experience fast or faster. Mm -hmm. This, you know, I asked them, they didn't go into it. They're like, right. well, we're going we're gonna to talk about it. We're maybe working on it still, whatever. But I don't know. I'd like to see that come back. All right, cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so we are going to get to some viewer questions in just a minute. But first, we're going to cut to a quick commercial break and be right back. Stay tuned. And we are back here live at E3 2014 with GameSpot's day one wrap-up. I'm Sean McInnes, Peter Brown, Chris Waters, Kevin Van Nord, and we've been talking about a whole bunch of the games that we've seen throughout the day today. Mm -hmm. But now we're going to take your guys' questions. If you want to tweet us with the hashtag GameSpotE3, feel free to do that now, and you may find your questions spoken by one of us. Probably me, because <laughs> I have a laptop <laughs> at the computer. <laughs> within the next few minutes. But what first, uh, what let's see what we've got here. Um, all right, here's one. Why didn't we see Fallout? It was one of the rumored games. There was a lot, a lot happening in the rumor mill about this one, but yeah. Bethesda showed up and they're like, meh, meh, no, no Mom's Fallout. the word, mum's nope. the word, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with Square and Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy 15, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just nowhere to be found. Um, there was some Kingdom Hearts on the floor. Kingdom Hearts 2.5. 2.5. Yeah, but not Kingdom Hearts 3, and that's the, that's, that's the big thing missing. Okay. So, I mean, my thing about it is, because I think, you know, they were, I think we kind of knew Bethesda might be showing something, but then that ended up being, uh, I think they did a, did a Doom thing or something. They announced that they were going to be talking about Doom. Just some Doom thing. Some yeah, Doom, some doom so, thing. I don't know. What do you call it? Doom? I just don't think they're there <laughs> yet. And I don't know whether that means yeah. that Bethesda's, you know, just not ready to show Fallout 4, whether or not maybe development's taking place somewhere else. Um, but they came out right out and said before the show that they wouldn't be showing anything new, yeah. you know, unannounced. And, you know, you want to see... When they say show it, you want something solid. I, you don't want yeah. the you don't want the EA developer interview conceptual prototype uh, treatment. Here's a bunch of meaningless bullshit. We're right. gonna talk for ten minutes and tell you absolutely nothing. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's disappointing. We don't want that. But like, you you know it's coming. It's gonna it's gonna happen. Yeah, it, it's got to. And I want it to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. I don't want I don't want no more you know that old engine. No, stuff. no way. Yeah. But I don't know if they can get away from it. I think they might just be stuck. It gets endemic. Stuck with it. It's just what they do now. Oh, well, uh, that NPC looks hella goofy. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so to that GameSpot fan who sent us the follow-up question, I'm sorry I forgot to read your name. That was a real bonehead move on my part. Who was it? I don't know. That oh. It's disappeared from this shared Google oh. Doc I'm using. Forever! Yeah, but if you know who you are, and you know that you're a great <laughs> human being, and we respect your contribution to this video program. Moving on to the next person. Uh, Crimson Jester has a question about The Witcher. Do you know if there's any sort of save importing from 2 to 3? Is there any continuation there? My understanding is that there is uh, a, a save uh, export, but I have no idea how it works. Right. There might be information out there, but I'm, it's not living in my head. Unfortunately, what is living in your head? <laughs> yeah, what what goes on up there? Well, in that it's brain sort of box. like my my Dark Souls character. I just basically there was an egg that appeared, and then three days later a tentacle came out. What do you know? So I've got a tentacle living in there. <laughs> Kevin Van Ord, in a yeah. nutshell. Why do you think I wear this hat all the time now? <laughs> tentacle containment, <laughs> important part of any E3. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next one comes to us from Turtles McGirdle, who asks, <laughs> hey. Guys, does Halo 3 from the Halo Master Chief Collection look the same, or is it different in any way? Ah, uh, you know, I got, I didn't get around to asking about Halo Okay, 3. so I can actually answer this question yeah. a little bit. Halo 2 is the game that's been given the full anniversary treatment. Yes. Right, the same way that Halo Combat Evolved got the full anniversary treatment a couple years ago. So that basically means, like, improved textures, right. improved character models, mm -hmm. the whole shebang. For Halo 3 and 4, they've uh, upscaled it. So now those games are running at 1080p, 60 frames a second. And mm -hmm. so naturally, they will look a bit better. Uh -huh. Just not quite the jump that you're going to see if you play Halo 2 in the Master right. Chief Collection. Totally. And you can still do the thing where you're like, you know, toggling back and forth. With Halo 3? I th wait, actually, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. I, mean, I think that that toggle is so impactful because you're going between overhaul yeah. assets. You're right. right. Okay. So if it's just like 
we we turned up the ball the the FPSs to eleven. Okay. What thir sixty? That's a good catch. That's a good quick catch. I, I was talking out of my ass just then, uh, but yeah, it will it will look it will look a bit better yeah, than you remember it here. Hey, I got a question about this thing. Like, ODST and, and Reach are not included in that. No, right? and they said, I asked about that uh, when I saw the game a few weeks back at like this pre E3 event, and I asked about that, and they said, this is Master Chief's story. Right. Yeah. Uh, we haven't, you know, we haven't ruled out the possibility of doing some a similar treatment for Reach and ODST, so they're definitely leaving that door open. But for this, it's you know, it's a direct preface to Halo Five. They're trying yeah. to get people back into the series who have maybe strayed from it, or at least freshen up people's knowledge of the lore. Just stoke that love for Mr. Chief. Stoke that <laughs> yeah. chief fire, bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> here we go, here's a good one. Skrillback, hey, who always hey, Skrillback. contributes what great up, questions <laughs> to our live streams, asks, what? Chris, how did you feel about the Devil's Third reveal? <laughs> I missed this. <laughs> what was that a reveal? I didn't even know. All right, so like it was the first gameplay, right? This was is the it? first we'd seen of the gameplay. I think. So uh, <laughs> there is a schedule for the E3 stage shows, and many games go on it before the shows start. Yeah. Mm, some games don't. It's unannounced PS4 game, unannounced Nintendo game. So in my preparations uh, for the show. There was an unannounced Nintendo game. Come to find out today, that is Devil's Third coming on the set with Tomonobu Itagaki, uh, a translator from Nintendo, and Danny Bilson uh, from Valhalla Studios, formerly of THQ, who was previously carrying the game, all coming on set to talk about Devil's Third. Mm -hmm. Chris runs to Wikipedia to learn about Devil's Third. <laughs> uh, that was, I mean, the game's looking a little rough. Uh, it's definitely a little bonkers. I think the funniest moment they did this multiplayer trailer where it's just kind of like these, it's a third person multiplayer shooter. Dudes running around a little stiffly, but like shooting each other and they're pulling out katanas and chopping each other up. And then they're like putting on masks, like kitten masks and wearing kimonos. And then they're like grabbing bananas and just chucking them off of a cliff into a giant fruit blender. Cause it had like fruit ninja mode in it. And it just looked like the thing that Itagaki kept stressing was like, let's man like, we don't want to take this too seriously, just have fun. Like, video games are fun, we want to be goofy with it. And it looked goofy, but it also looked, you know, they're trying to make a serious third-person shooter with a uh, cover mechanic and shooting, but also with, like, bonkers melee attacks and, like, sprinting at a dude to punch his face out and then, like, stab him to bits. Uh, looked rough. So know. how, how upfront are we allowed to be? Like, are we allowed to just let it all hang out? Like, Kevin, please, let it all hang out. Hang that something. game looks like Balzania. <laughs> Wow, so, mm. that is a very specific that game is flavor of like casserole <laughs> dish bowl, seven layer. Wow, seven I layer. just spit You've got all the ricotta, <laughs> you've got the mozzarella, no. you've got the marinara, <laughs> and the secret ingredient to that lasagna is balls. balls. Mm. Not, not I was so. not impressed, but you never know. Okay. Like There are certain things that can show poorly and then get really cleaned up afterwards. This doesn't very strike me as that you. kind very of game, fair, Kevin. but I will be... Cautiously optimistic. Yeah, thanks for that question, Scrollback. <laughs> there we go. Scrollback, great guy. Love that guy. All right, next question is about Batman <laughs> Arkham Knight, a game that I actually got to check out today, mm -hmm. which looked awesome, by the way. Did really it? enjoyed it. It looked one. awesome yeah, at the end looked, of the Sony press conference. It really oh, yeah. did. It was yeah. one of the best shows. I'm yeah. so glad that it's next gen only because the, like, the scale of those environments and the way that you're able to maneuver around them is just like, you, you've just got so much more freedom. Yes. And it's nice. Um, I like it. F. E. Fritzy says, Batman has never used guns, and so how does Rocksteady justify them on the Batmobile? So they did specifically point this out to me when I was using the Batmobile, which is it's smart enough to know whether you're firing at you know vehicles or a building, like trying to knock out a wall in a building, or whether you're firing, firing at human enemies. And when it isolates those human enemies, you're actually going to be firing what are essentially tranquilizer rounds, and you knock those guys out. I, oh, man. I did have one funny moment, though, which is when these guys are like on this very narrow bridge, okay. right? Yeah. And I have to take them out with the trank rounds. And so they're just, they're down on the ground and they're sleeping. And, but there's no room on this bridge for me to go around them. So I'm taking my Batmobile directly over them. And I essentially run those guys over with my giant bat tank. Tires are smart enough to know when to <laughs> lift off the ground to not crush a human torso, Sean. Yeah. 
Um, it's because of bat science. Right, right, of course. So, I mean, <laughs> Rocksteady is very careful with the lore, and they're making sure to specifically mention, like, that Batman is not killing people with these things. At the same time, it's a video game and unpredictable moments occur. Sure. And a little bit of suspension of disbelief is required. Because I definitely ran those dudes over and made dude pancakes <laughs> And then pancakes backed up over them. them. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then rolled over them again. Yeah. It uh, feels like obeying the letter of the law, if not the spirit. Right, you know? exactly. Oh, but my god, Arkham Knight, so good. That Batmobile, like, yeah. when they first talked about it, I was like, oh. That was never what was great about Arkham City was, you know, obviously there was no vehicle in that, but what I really liked about that was being the kind of like hidden predator in the darkness and then like you're crawling up on the gargoyles and then you pounce on the guys. It just felt very surgical and deliberate, which yeah. is something that the Batmobile isn't really. Oh, but it's so good. It's so fun. It feels like a direct extension of Batman. And it's pretty amazing. I have a question about Batman. Yes. This isn't a question about the game. This is a question about Batman. Okay, so Batman is an orphan. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. But so he's also a scientist. He's also a scientist. He's also a billionaire playboy. Right. But he knows that there are worse things than death, being an orphan and having watched a you know a parent murder sure. in front of his face. Yeah. So do you suppose he doesn't kill people specifically because he wants them to suffer worse than in death? Do you think that Batman is actually far worse is he than, real? Than, than people that actually kill? Do you think he's the real enemy? Wow, this is this wow. sounds this sounds right. like you're launching a political campaign in Gotham City yeah. uh, against like Commissioner Gordon on your anti-Batman platform. I'm just saying there are worse things than death. And Batman seems to understand this. He's Yowzes. anguished every day. He's Yowzes. trying to bring this anguish to others. He knows that there is sleep in death, but there is torture in life. I'm just saying. It's grim. Well, grim talk you know what? Kevin the Hi, kids. That's an open-ended question. We're not gonna, we're not gonna tackle that one right That's now. That's a rhetorical We're action. just gonna move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Can it be about resolution? Which, which is... How many P's okay. are there in Batman's suit? How many P's are necessary to display the full range of human grief? Oh, oh boy. Wow. <laughs> David Cage knows the answer. <laughs> so, ring him up. Oh, where was David Cage? Where's know, my Where is Green he? He's demo. nowhere to Come be on. seen. Um, let me see. Let me, all right, we've got time for one more question. I want to make sure it's a good one. We had one here about... Uh, let's see. Okay, Moneybags133 says, "What do you think of Xenoblade Chronicles X?" Terrible Kevin. question. Kevin, <laughs> that's not a terrible question. Even I'm though I already kidding. answered it do you earlier. Want, do you want a terrible? I'll give you a terrible question because okay. I've got plenty. Okay, oh, no. bring them on. You've All already right. given me a terrible okay. question. Here we go. <laughs> Peter, a real scooter question. asks, "If you had to get one tattoo on your shoulder of a game show at E3, <laughs> what would it be?" <laughs> You know why that's terrible? Because Kevin already got that tattoo. I already have a tattoo. Shoulder, Sean. Yeah. Totally but this would different be a shoulder. question. And it show, the be people, show the people your oh, tattoo. Oh, this? Oh, yeah. that's an Assassin's Creed thing. Yeah, there it is. But uh, that's back when Assassin's Creed was about assassination. I would get Ori and the Blind Forest tattooed. It looks gorgeous, that game right? Is the game wonderful. does look gorgeous. Oh, yeah. It would be like a teardrop tattoo. Oh, wait, wait. I got it. I would get Geralt's scar. Like, yeah. just. Yeah. Bam. Yeah, that. I think you can. My pull that job. Off. The, the the possibilities of future jobs are endless. All right. When we're you gonna get a again. Tattoo. Okay. Shoulder. We know what you want, <laughs> Peter. What would you I get? I can I can get a tattoo of an eye with yeah. no, the no, thing. No, no. You've already answered the real scooter's <laughs> question. God damn it. To thorough levels of detail. I want to hear what Peter would get. I'd get a silhouette of a goat being pulled up by a Fulton balloon. <laughs> oh, yes. Fulton goat. That would be great. Somebody send us artwork for that. Please send it. <laughs> a quick Photoshop of a goat getting Fulton recovery. Get us a quick MS Paint of a uh, Fulton yes. recovered goat. <laughs> Please, and then tweet us. I'm at M S McInnes. These guys also have Twitter handles that are yeah. less relevant. Mm -hmm. I might get that tattoo. Chris. Uh, does it have to be my shoulder? Uh, anywhere, anywhere. All right, well, I think a Witcher tattoo is a great idea, but I feel like, uh, you know that medallion that's the wolf's head that Geralt wears? Yeah, totally. I think just that right here, like a Superman chest, just like a real, real fierce wolf, so that like, anytime I go to the beach, people are like, why is that pasty, skinny dude have that terrifying wolf on oh, his chest? Oh, oh. He must be a sociopath. Idea for that. Okay. So make it so that your nipples are right where the eyes are. So what happens it's is genius. when you go to the beach and you get a sunburn, they like glow red, just like the thing. <laughs> it's 
too good. Do that. Have to do it. Um, all right. So now that Cut we Cut Kevin's mic. Cut Kevin's mic. Just delved way too deep. Oh, into sorry. All did of you think you were gonna get away from answering this question yourself? Oh yeah. Sean. No, he I said did. Ori. I said Ori. Oh, Ori in the yeah. Ori. Oh, right, fair enough. I'm informed there's beer, beer back on <laughs> oh, stage. What? He's bringing hipster oh. beer. So before we hand it off to our friends, my a reward. giant bomb. Oh goodness. Oh, that one's gonna explode. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Ah, Responsible that decisions. one's for you. You've, you've worked hard today. Before we hey. hand it off to our friends at Giant Bomb, cool. let's take a minute or two. Like Thank, thanks for the water, Danny. About our, this is getting this is, real I'll get drunk messy. on this h 2 We're going to talk here. about what we've got coming up. What are All you guys right. looking forward to? What's on your schedule for the rest of the show? 10 a.m. tomorrow, kicking off live stage show with Evolve. Having them up there talking about the new Cthulhu face monster. That was one of my most anticipated games coming in tomorrow and uh, coming to the show, and I'm super psyched to do it tomorrow. Really excited. Yeah. What else do you have coming up, Kevin? I don't remember a goddamn thing about well, what I've seen tomorrow. All right. Are you going to walk the show floor and check out anything I, that you're not I, assigned? I do want to check some. I want to really check out Shadow of Mordor. Yeah, me part too. Because it has, it reminds me so much of Assassin's Creed, but it's like Assassin's Creed in Middle Earth, and that's why I'm so interested in it, is I want to check it out. I want to play it. Let's see. Yeah. Peter? Hatsune Miku Project Diva F. Wow. <laughs> Did not oh, wait, expect wait, that wait. No, wait. No, I didn't mean to admit oh, that. Okay, no, wait. Okay, okay. <laughs> it just came out. <laughs> Shit. Uh, I've got a bunch of uh, Oculus Rift demos set up, uh, so I'm excited to see that. One of them is Alien Isolation. Ooh, that would work really well. I'm very curious to see how, how that handles. We'll see. That's also going to be on our live stage show tomorrow at about 10.45. Tight. Yeah. There's a lot of Project Morpheus stuff, too. Are you going to check out any of that? Uh, I saw a bunch of it today, actually. One of the in most interesting ones was a Street Luge demo. Street Luge. They put me on a big-ass beanbag, told me to lay back, and then I oh, literally, yes. like... And that's <laughs> when the fun started. Yeah. <laughs> there were hands coming Not out of... Think of England. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty good. And one of the cool things is you can't pass under cars. Like if you, you're going to hit a car, it just blinks red and there's a sound. But a truck, you can go underneath that and you can see the under, underside of the truck on your street luge. That, like honestly, that popped up when they were doing their Project Morpheus and it was like street luge. And first I was like, oh, that's stupid as hell, the extreme sports street luge. That's going to Actually, that's going to be You great. control it with your head. You literally are yeah. in this beanbag just leaning a little bit. And you go, and it's really fast oh, and cool slightly stuff. terrifying. You get used to the fact that you're not actually going to get hurt, but it's not like immersion in the sense that I believed I was doing it. But I definitely was like not thinking. I'm in VR. This is a game. I was totally buying into the whole like you know leaning around. Like, oh, yeah, oh. it was good. Did you make those noises? <laughs> Maybe. Cool. I'm not you did, didn't you? Yeah, cool. Cool. you did. Upcoming sequel, Street. What about you, Sean? What you got? I am so I forget whether it's Wednesday or Thursday, but I get to host the. Uh, Hideo Kojima, Kojima, Hideo Kojima <laughs> demo. He's gonna demo himself. Heidi Kojims. Yeah. Uh, the Phantom Pain demo on our stage show. Nice. nice. And it's gonna be fun. I've never talked to Kojima before. Oh really? You've talked to him. Right? Yeah, I get to talk to him again on Thursday for probably I don't know a half a dozen time. Wow. Maybe you might say my sixth time. I hear he's a fun guy to talk to. Well. Yeah. Depends on what you ask yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> you can be very particular. Yeah, Depends yeah. on whether you stick to the, the, the uh, questions you are allowed to ask Kojima. Right, yeah. it's very uh, specific. Yeah. I'm going to ask him about Fulton recovering a goat. That's what I'm going to do. Do it. Totally. Sure. Yeah, sure. I feel like he would yeah. be into that. So what does a goat do on Mother Base, if not just entertain <laughs> the soldiers? Well, how does it contribute to the overall morale of Diamond Dogs? <laughs> would you milk the goat? I well, think this so. Is the, All right. This milk, is the goat, goat simulator tie-in. Mother Base is going to be a new <laughs> downloadable level for goat simulator, right? Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. You heard it here first. Yeah. All right. So with that scoop out of the way, <laughs> downloadable goat simulator for Phantom Pain? Yeah. 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 Uh, we're going to go ahead and throw it to our friends over at Giant Bomb. They're going to begin their live evening extravaganza, and it's always a lot of fun, so you guys should make sure to check that out. Make sure to come back tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. Pacific yeah. for our continued live show here at E3 2014. So on behalf of my wonderful guests here, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.